right, folks. Good to have everybody. Amen. I have a word of prayer and get into our lesson today. Father, Lord, give me wisdom now in this book, the Holy Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, I want you to uh, turn to the book of Romans, if you will, with me this morning, please. And uh, chapter number 1 and verse number 16. We're still studying the doctrine of the new birth. The new birth will keep you out of a lot of trouble when it comes to uh, doctrine, especially in the present day. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 16. The apostle said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice that term Jew shows up here in your Bible. Uh, do we still have Jews? We certainly do. 2,000 years later, we have Jews. Did we have Jews before this New Testament was written? Yes, we did. Uh, Jews have been around for a long time. Uh, we go back in ancient history and find out the term Jew comes from uh, Judah and uh, get into all that. But what I want to deal with this morning is the uh, issue of Jew and Gentile. Now, we are a Gentile. We are Gentiles. Uh, how do we get that designation? Where do all men come from? When uh, Noah migrated the plains of Shinar, he had three sons. Who were they? All right, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, the North American Indian, the Eskimo, the Maya, the Aztec, all the South American Indians, the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and, uh, uh, and all of the Asians, uh, along with the Hebrew, are sons of Shem. Uh, one of the uh, rem remarkable characteristics of the Indian, at least why the North American Indian, is that, uh, my understanding, most of them have O-type blood. That's quite a remarkable thing. makes you wonder what's going on. But in any event, the sons of Shem uh, make up that group that I mentioned. The sons of uh, Japheth, which means spread out, uh, are uh, the uh, Western European countries, Russia, the uh, uh, ones that Hitler hated so much, the, uh, uh, what was it, the Russians he called them, the, uh, the, the Slavs, the Slavs, Russia, uh, uh, Hitler hated the Slavs. And, uh, of course, America is, made a, is a melting pot made up of... Uh, all the races come over to this country and settled. And uh, why is it called a melting pot? Yeah, more to it than that. Why is it called a melting pot? That's it right there. That's the answer. All the different races from all over the world come into America and become one person. A melting pot reduces down to the one, one person. In other words, you become an American, okay? You become an American, all right? You're, you're no longer an Italian, a Frenchman, a Spanish, African, German, what have you. You're an American. Yep. Well, it's quiet in here, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Anyway, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three sons of Noah. Shem makes up the, the uh, as I told you a moment ago, uh, Japheth spread out the uh, uh, Western European and the rest of them. And then Ham. Psalm 105 says that Africa is the land of Ham. All right, so Ham migrated to Africa. From his uh, progeny came the Canaanites. God told uh, Joshua to drive the Canaanite out of the land. All right, now you can run back. This is not about genealogy today and all of that, but I'll guarantee you one thing. If you'll take the Bible and run it back and study the scriptures and find out the origins of humanity, you'll have a basis and a foundation that, the, that an anthropologist at the University of Tennessee doesn't have a clue. You will. You'll have a foundation to tell you why we are, what we are, and where we came from. Okay, now where the Jews come from, they came from Shem, right? All right, they came from Shem. Now the Jew, I'm not talking about the, the Jew itself. Uh, the Jews came from uh, the ancient Hebrews. 
The ancient Hebrew would be from uh, Eber in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. Eber it was the father of the Hebrew. That's where the name Hebrew comes from, Eber. All right. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was a Hebrew, but he was the father of the Jews uh, in the sense that uh, his genealogy preceded the Jews. At the time of Christ, the Apostle Paul says the Jews had their own religion. He said, I profited in the Jews' religion. Now, what would that be? What do you suppose the Jews' religion would be when he talks about that? Why would he make such a... Why would he, why would he categorize something like that? The Jews' religion. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of Abraham, right? The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. All right, he manifested himself to them, became the friend of God, Abraham did. Is there anything wrong with the faith of the God of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Nathaniel, when he said Nathaniel, well, that's what we're getting into. Uh, Nathaniel, he said, is an Israelite in, who is, in whom is no guile indeed. Notice he used the term Israelite. All right. What did you just read in Romans chapter number 1 and verse 16? Jew. All right. Now, when the Apostle Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion, he was talking about a religion. All right. The Jews' religion teaches that at the mountain, when God uh, gave the law to Moses, he received the written law, which is the Torah. All right, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. He received the written law. God said, write a book, so he wrote it down. There you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I do not believe that Genesis is a myth. I believe Genesis is history. I believe it's inspired scripture. I believe you can base your soul on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. It's referred to time and time again by the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples in the New Testament. Quoted. The New Testament quotes the Pentateuch time and again. All right. But the Jews' religion also teaches that God gave the oral law to Moses at Sinai. The oral law is called the Mishnah. The Mishnah has uh, been... Uh, uh, has been, uh, has been uh, commented on time and time and time and time and time again by the rabbis. That makes the Gemara. The Gemara is the commentary on the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the oral law, supposedly, that was given to Moses at, the Mount, at Mount Sinai. So now we have two laws. When Christ was here 2,000 years ago, the Jewish religion, and I'm not talking about the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that was the faith that Zacharias had and Elizabeth had, the parents of John the Baptist. That was the faith of Simeon and Anna. That was the faith of Nathaniel and many others. The faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the pure faith that God revealed when he manifested himself to them, which gave birth to our faith. It gave birth to our faith. Christianity did not just pop up among the Gentiles. The faith that we hold precious and dear came to us from the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to destroy the law. He said, what? Uh, which law? See, this forces us into the situation. We have an oral law and we have a written law. So which law is he talking about? Now, you know, I'm not trying to trick you. The written law, all right? The Word of God is written. Okay, now you have a Genesis through Malachi. Uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they're continuing to find, as a matter of fact, they're continuing because so many small fragments, they're deciphering this stuff, but uh, they haven't found any problems with the, and this date's about 200 B.C., okay, 200 B.C., 250 B.C., the, uh, the uh, uh, scrolls. They have found that uh, the scrolls, of course no New Testament existed in 250 B.C., Okay, no New Testament existed, but the Old Testament did. For the last book of the Old Testament was the book of Malachi, chronologically it was, uh, written about 400 and so B.C. Okay, so you're looking at something that's only removed about 100 to 150 years from the writing of the last book of the Old Testament. How many follow me here so far? So when they found these Dead Sea Scrolls, they thought, my, what a find. I mean, this is going to, this is going to be an earth-shaking event. Well... To the scholar's dismay, the Dead Sea Scrolls did not contradict the Old Testament, the written word, okay? The written word. All right. So 
When the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, he said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And every jot and every tittle. All right, he did. But which law? See, was it the oral law or the written law? Well, now you see the problem with an oral law is that an oral law is subject to interpretation and change and, uh, and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, like a chameleon to put on whatever it needs to down through the ages. All right. 2,000 years ago when the Lord was here, young men had memorized the Mishnah. The Mishnah was the oral law. I'm not saying for one minute that I believe the Mishnah is equal to the Torah. Not for a second. I believe the Torah or the, the Old Testament Scripture, the Torah, of course, refers to the first five books. The writings, the prophets, and, and, and the law. That, make up, that makes up the, the Torah, Ketuvim, and Navim. Make up the three portions of the Old Testament. Navim is the prophet, Ketuvim is the writing, and the Torah is the law. And I do not believe for one minute that the, uh, that the oral law in any way uh, denigrates or uh, uh, judges or is used as a, as a critique of the written law because it's not. The written law is the Word of God. The oral law is a creation of man. 2,000 years ago, the oral law was in existence. This is what the Lord Jesus said, you've made the Word of God, which He called the written law, of none effect by your, oral, by your traditions. Your traditions, okay? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about what has become to be known today as the Talmud. The Talmud was not written down 2,000 years ago, but the foundation of the Talmud, which is the Mishnah, was, in, was oral. It was, it was memorized. Uh, for example, when um, you enter into any mystery religion, you will always memorize certain things. And along with memorizing them, you will memorize... The code words, how to interpret it and how you answer publicly to a thing and how you believe it privately, okay? You believe it privately one, time, one, one way, but for the consumption of the public, you, you answer it another way. How many believe that? How many of you really believe that what the government telling you is true? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you believe that uh, digital television is, is simply because they want you to have a better picture? Okay. What you're having in your house is a computer, digital television computer code. And obviously it is better as far as that's concerned, but it's also far, 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 far more powerful than an analog display. Far more powerful. All right. So the Mishnah 2,000 years ago, with the oral law, the Mishnah became the basis of the Talmud. The Talmud is the, law, is the, is the, is the foundation. It is the... It is the it is the, it's the faith, it is, it, is, it is what they believe is the actual faith of the Jew. And therefore, it is the Jew's religion. Okay? It has nothing to do with the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You get hold of this now. This is important. Very important. Because this will help you understand Romans chapter number 11. What a Jew, <clears throat> what a Jew believes today, when I say a Jew... We understand, of course, Judaism is broken down into about four or five different categories and subcategories, and away it goes. You've got Reformed Jews, you've got Conservative Jews, you've got Hasidic Jews, you've got European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, you've got Sephardic Jews, you've got uh, Kairite Jews who don't even believe that uh, they, they reject the Talmud, they reject the, the uh, Mishnah and the Gemara, and the Kairite Jews stick solely with the Old Testament Scriptures. And you've got all kinds of branches of Judaism, and then... And then uh, parts in, in all of that, see. You say, well, why, why are you telling us all of this? Because that's where you came from. We did not come from the Druids. We did not come from Zoroastrianism. We did not come from Mithra, the, the religion of the Romans. What you believe, you believe in a man who was born 2,000 years ago, a son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who went to the cross and died for you. That's who you believe in. Now, you'll find a, a bunch of Gentiles that say he wasn't a Jew. And you get into all kinds of stuff there because they've demonized the Jew to such a point that uh, Jesus Christ couldn't be their Savior. For example, Adolf Hitler did that. And I mentioned that the other day. Hitler demonized the Jews to the point to where he had a dilemma. What am I going to do with Jesus Christ? So he, uh, uh, he dealt with it in another fashion. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, folks. Jew can be spoken of in two ways then. The Jewish religion and the ethnicity. All right. In other words, he's a Jew by birth, but then he becomes, then he embraces the Jewish religion. You follow me on that? He's born a Jew by birth, by genealogy, but he may embrace the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 2,000 years ago, there was a distinct difference between the Jews' religion and the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. An absolute distinct difference. They were not the same. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed up 2,000 years ago, he fulfilled the prophets of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jews' religion was, was so steeped in the Mishnah and the Gemara and the Talmud that it rejected the Son of God based on that junk and not on the Bible. They did not reject the Lord Jesus Christ based on the Scripture. They rejected Him based on their Talmud. That's how they rejected Him. That's how they reject Him to this day. I got to nosing around on the Internet here and found that you can, uh, the Sosino Talmud, is about 12,000 pages. And we're talking about the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, it has been published online now. About uh, 8,000 pages of the Talmud is there. If you want to go through it, run references, it's there for you. And you can read the, the Talmud. It's, it's, it's a Babylonian Talmud. is published online. And if you want to do any, if what you want, to, if you like to do this, type, Babylonian Talmud, or just type Talmud plus Jesus, okay, on Google. And you'll be amazed at what you pull up. Because what you'll pull up is all kinds of references in the Talmud to the Lord Jesus Christ. But what you're going to find is that people have done their research in the past, and they have found the places in the Talmud that refer to Jesus Christ, but the name Jesus is not showing up. So if you're going to try to run through the Talmud and find the name Jesus, you're, you're not going to find it that much. It's a common name 2,000 years ago. It's going to be in there. But it's not going to be referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've got code names for Him. See, that's what you're going to find. But what you, when, you, when you do this, what, what's it say to you? You hear, you hear you have a book 2,000 years old, and it's full of references to a man who lived 2,000 years ago. What does that tell you about that man that lived 2,000 years ago? He lived, didn't he? <laughs> it certainly does. It tells you he lived. He was there, along with Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, and uh, Josephus, and the rest of them. Uh, Jewish historians, uh, uh, Josephus was, Roman historians, Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, and the rest of them. A whole list. That's just a few that, uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. I'm not trying to prove that Jesus Christ lived. He lives in me. I know that right now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But if you want to, that's what's called apologetics. That gets into the idea or the doctrine of let's prove it, okay? Let's, let's present this paper and give the facts about did this man, Jesus Christ, live? Yeah, he lived. Yeah, he lived. There's an overwhelming abundance of evidence that he lived. No question about that. And he still lives. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. No doubt about that whatsoever. All right. So now the Jews' religion. The Jews' religion. What is the Jews' religion then, therefore? It is, is, is it what Abraham believed? No, it's not what Abraham believed. It's not what Jeremiah believed, Isaiah believed, Ezekiel, Hosea, Daniel, Amos. Did these men believe what the Jews' religion teaches? No. Well, then did these prophets believe what the Jews teach today? No. 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 There's one remarkable thing. If Isaiah walked down, the, walked down the main street in Jerusalem right now, he could understand everything they were saying. Isaiah lived 2,700 years ago. Do you know how many people were speaking English 2,700 years ago? <laughs> it didn't exist. But Hebrew did. And Hebrew is a language that goes as far back as you can trace it. In other words, you can't find the source of it. As Bullinger says, hunt as much as you want to, you'll never find where it came from. It's always been around. So I personally believe that when Adam began to name the animals, he named them in Hebrew. <laughs> sure do. All right, so now when the Jews' religion, the Apostle Paul deals with it in the book of Romans. 
Romans. He writes a letter to a church in Rome, which is a Gentile church. Then he brings up the Jews. Now, if you'll remember uh, from your history books that when Rome burned, who got blamed for it? And Jews. Usually in the ancient world, they, they, uh, they lumped them together. If they blamed the Christians, they blamed the Jews. If they blamed the Jews, they blamed the Christians. Because even the Gentiles back then had enough, had enough sense to know that there were so many things uh, common between a Jew and, and a Christian. You see, they both use the same Bible. A Jew still has the Old Testament, but he believes the Talmud. And he filters everything said in the Bible by the Talmud. But he still has the Bible. I bought one in a Jewish bookstore in Jerusalem. In Hebrew. And it's the same book you have right here. So, in the book of Romans, he addresses the church in Rome. And he addresses the Jews. Talks about the Jews and their condition. Talks about the Gentiles who have never heard the word of God out here in the bush. Then he talks about the Gentiles who have heard the word of God. He talks about the Jews who have accepted Christ, and he talks about the Jews who, re who rejected Christ. He's covered quite a bit of ground, hasn't he, in the book of Romans. You have all these questions. You say, what happens to them who've never heard? Read Romans. What happens to the Jews today who've uh, rejected Christ? Read Romans. How do you get saved? Read Romans. What's the gospel? Read Romans. The book of Romans, of all books in the New Testament, loaded. And the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the great theme of the book of Romans is salvation, national and personal. Okay? Books of the New Testament have their burden. They have their message. They have their theme. The book of Ephesians is glorification. It's the, it's the, it's the exaltation of Christ at the right hand of the Father and the glorification of the church and the power through the church. The book of Colossians has to do with the essence of who Jesus Christ is. It talks about Him being the creator of all things. The book of Colossians deals with that. The book of Philippians is a practical book that deals with the application of the Scriptures and the preaching of the Gospel. All right? The book of Philemon deals with, the, deals with the runaway Jew. So when you get into the book of Romans, you're dealing with the book that deals with salvation. All right? So why wouldn't it deal with the salvation of those who've never heard, the salvation of those who have heard, the salvation of Gentiles, and salvation of Jews? Right? What group have I left out? So the book of Romans deals with all of that. The 10th chapter of Romans and the, and the 13th verse says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? How many of you have ever used that chapter when you, when you quote, unquote, led somebody to the Lord? Well, let me tell you what leading you did. You were simply a human instrument giving the word out, the Holy Ghost doing the leading. <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. <clears throat> but... The thirteenth chap uh, the uh, tenth chapter of Romans, the thirteenth verse says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at the ninth chapter of the book of Romans and look at the burden that the apostle has here. What did I do? Here they are. The ninth chapter of Romans. Verse one. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself, accursed from Christ, for my brethren, note carefully, my kinsmen according to what? Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, glory, covenants, giving of the law, service of God, and promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. He said a lot right there. Notice what he called himself. A what? Verse 4. He called himself an Israelite. Look at Romans chapter number 11 and verse 1. I say then hath God cast away his people. God forbid, for I also am an what? Israelite. So the Lord uses two terms in the book of Romans to refer to the same people. But he's not referring to the same people in every sense. But he's referring to the same people. In Romans 1 verse 16, he calls them Jews. Then in Romans chapter number 11, he says Israelites. All right? 
Up until the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, he's dealing with the Gentile and the Jew. And he's talking about the salvation of the Gentile and the salvation of the Jew. No difference. No difference. In plain words, a Jew is saved exactly as a Gentile is saved. When someone comes down to the front here and you open the Bible, have you ever had anybody say, are you an Italian? Or are you a Greek? No. You're lost. See? Where they came from has nothing to do with it. Are you a Jew? No. You lead a Jew to the Lord the same way you do a Gentile. He believes the same thing. All right. So individual salvation is dealt with in the book of Romans. But national salvation is also dealt with in the book of Romans. Remember last week when we went to the book of Revelation? And it says, The nations of them which are saved walk in the light of it. Walk in the light of what? The New Jerusalem. And what does the book of Revelation say the New Jerusalem is? It's a city, but what is it? It's the bride of Christ. All right? It's a city that is the bride of Christ that has Gentile nations on the earth in eternity walking in the light of it. And they are nations that are saved. And they go in and out and in and out of that city. But now when it refers to you as the Gentile body of Christ... And that's something that developed in the New Testament. It didn't start as a Gentile body, but it developed into a Gentile body. But it's not exclusively a Gentile body because Jews have always been part of the body of Christ. But in any event, the body of Christ he called the church of the firstborn. All right? Firstborn by the Holy Ghost. But the Gentiles are, Gentile nations are saved and they walk in the light of it, in the light of the New Jerusalem. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between the church of the firstborn and Gentile nations which are saved walking in the light of the new Jerusalem in eternity? Absolutely. Things that are different are different. All right. Chronologically, let's look at it. This is 2009. I'm talking about something way up yonder in the future because at least a thousand years is going to pass before then and seven years is going to pass before then. So a thousand and seven years into the future, nations that are saved are going to be walking in the light of the new Jerusalem. The nations are going to be on this earth walking in the light of the new Jerusalem and we already are members of the church of the firstborn. They didn't say a thing about them being part of any church anywhere. And it doesn't say a thing about them being born again. Because once you're a born again, you become a son of God and a priest. And the Apostle Peter says that you are a royal priesthood. Therefore, you are a priesthood, not only a priesthood in the sense that you're a son of Aaron, but royal blood is in your veins. How so? Because I am a son of God. There is no greater king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Well, if I'm a priest and I'm a royal priest and therefore having a royalty, I have a dominion, I have a kingdom, and I'm a priest, therefore I represent God, represent men to God, then that puts me in a particular category, doesn't it? And every last born-again believer, and every one of you, if you're saved in this age of grace, if you are part of the body of Christ, you're born again. All right. If you're born again, you're born of God, born from above, you're a priest, and you're a royal priest. That means somewhere in the future, there's something. Going, there's a reason for God making you a priest. Why is He going to make you a priest? Why are you a royal priesthood? Why is there a royalty attached to it, see? So in the book of Romans, the apostle deals with individual salvation, salvation of the Gentile, salvation of the Jew. He deals with Jews under the law. He deals with, he deals with Gentiles out here in the bush. That's never heard the gospel. He talks about them and then he talks about the Gentiles, uh, the Jews. Then he talks about, he brings in another term. And that term he uses in the book of Romans chapter number 11. And he brings it up and he says, Israelite. Now what has he introduced here? Why didn't he use Israelite in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? There's something different, isn't there? Absolutely. You need, an, you need a mind that has been... That God has energized, that God, a heart that God has opened, a spirit that's born again, the natural man receiveth not the things the Spirit of God. You need to ask questions. Things that are different, there's got to be a reason. Why is it different? It's not the same. So you fly across that and think, well, he's talking about the same people, but he's making a different application. At the beginning of the book of Romans, he's talking about Jews. Now he's talking about Israelites. Israelite has to do more with, not with the individual, but with a 
nation. National. So the 11th chapter of the book of Romans has individual salvation in it, but the main focus of the 11th chapter of the book of Romans is national. It has to do with the Israelite as a nation, Israel as a nation. Now, we went a long time, folks. If you'd been living in, if you'd been, if, let's, let's say, for example, you lived in uh, Macon, Georgia in 1850. All right, I said, let's go to Israel. What would you say? There is no Israel. We can go to Palestine. That's what it was called in 1850. Palestine. That's what it was called all the way up until May the 14th, 1948. It was called Palestine. Where did it get the term Palestine from? Where? It was a Roman called it that. A Roman emperor. That's it. From the word Philistine. From their ancient enemy, he renamed the country. All right? That would be like calling America Indian land because when the first uh, uh, you know first two or three hundred years it was one dog fight after another uh, with the Indians uh, Native Americans <laughs> you know it's hard on people who were born in one generation and then go into another generation where all the terminology changes on them somewhere along the way have you, ever had, have you ever had a problem with that? Everything was named one thing back then and now it's all changed. I'd like to get a hold of the fellow that did the changing, wouldn't you? Have you ever thought about where it started? Have you ever, have you ever done any research and find out where did political correctness start? It originated somewhere. Okay? Where they renamed everything? Why do you rename everything? Why did they rename Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Why did they rename Daniel to Belteshazzar? Why did they rename? They're changing identities. When you change identity, you rewrite history. Political correctness has to do with rewriting the origins, foundations, and identity of this country. Remember that America is a melting pot. A melting pot means that you come from the four corners of the earth. makes no difference where you come from, what part of the world you come from. You become an American. Right? The Gestapo will come and get me for saying that, you see. But in any event, where were we? <laughs> no, where were we when I got off on all that? <laughs> I've lost my chain of thought. <laughs> Palestine. Hadrian. <laughs> Hadrian renamed it Palestine after the ancient Philist after the, their, their enemies, the Philistines. There's a map in Jordan. It's called the Madaba map. It's inside a church. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever laid my eyes on. It's on the King's Highway. It's in Moa. It's in uh, Jordan, which would be, uh, I think it's Jordan. Of course, is a modern creation, but I think it's in the area of uh, Moab. But in any event, this church has a mosaic floor that has an ancient mosaic of Jerusalem. And right smack down the middle is a Cardo Maximus. At the end of it is an image to, uh, I think it's Zeus. And uh, Hadrian had, uh, had, had a statue erected to himself. He changed the name of the city from Jerusalem to what? Alia Capitolina. And changed the name of the country from Israel or the Holy Land to Palestine. All right. Now, I don't know if most reporters with CBS, NBC, and ABC and the rest of them know that, but that's a fact. That's a fact of history. That's a fact. That is a fact. That can be researched and proven anywhere you want to. Okay. So they've changed it. They changed it to uh, Palestine. So in 1850, there was no Israel, according to the geography of the maps. By the way, uh, most people don't know this either. CBS, NBC, and ABC, and the rest of them. But if you go to any school in any Arab country and they give you a map of uh, the Middle East, it will not say Israel. And whatever, they're, whatever they call it, they may call it Palestine, whatever they want to call it. Uh, they'll call it the Noble Sanctuary in Jerusalem, Al-Quds, I think it is. You'll have all that, but you won't have Israel. They refuse to recognize Israel as a nation. Now, let me ask you a question. Which came first, Israel or 
Muhammad. Chronologically, who was here first? All right, in the Holy Land. Who was there first? Israel or Muhammad? Israel. Okay. Uh, have you noticed in the last uh, 20, 30 years here in this country how they're trying to right old wrongs? How many has noticed that? Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if that's universal? To right old wrongs? What old wrong? When those Italians, <laughs> Italy didn't exist 2,000 years ago, but they were Romans. Rome's the capital of Italy. Drove out the Jews. Let me ask you a question. What right did Rome have to be in Israel? Somebody give me, somebody give me the right they had to be there. Do you know what an empire is? It was an empire. An empire's purpose is conquest. It's when you go from one nation to the other nation to the other nation to the other nation and you, you, are, you, you, can't, you uh, take command, authority, and control over that country and those people and put them under your sovereignty, okay? All right, you conquer them. Like William the Conqueror, when he, the Norman, when he went into England, he conquered England. William the, William the Conqueror was a, was a uh, Norman, which was an uh, offshoot of the, of the uh, uh, what do they call them, the Vikings, and then for something like five, six hundred years in Great Britain, he built, uh, of course he died out, but his, his people built uh, castles all over the place and conquered the land, the Normans. All right. What right did he have to be in England? What right did Rome have to be in Israel? Whose country was it? Was it Rome's country or was it the Jews' country? It was the Jews' country. You see what I mean? All right. Now, you say, well, no, wait a minute. The Jews had to drive out the, uh, the uh, uh, Canaanites. Okay, but hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let's run our genealogy back. Where did God make Adam? Where's the Garden of Eden located? Well, there's two rivers, four rivers there. The Gihon, Pison, Hittichel, and the Euphrates. All right, they come together. All right, they form a head. All right, the... the Land between the rivers literally means Mesopotamia, okay? All right, where did, where did Abraham, where, where did God call Abraham from? All right, where is, yes, right, or the Chaldees, where is it located in what's called modern day Iraq, okay? All right, all the way from that river, that river in Saddam Hussein's country, the Euphrates, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, every bit of that land, all of that was the land of Eden. The Garden of Eden was eastward in Eden, remember? Eastward in Eden. God made Adam. Exactly the spot, I don't know. The rabbis teach that God made him right there on the top of Moriah. That's what they teach. Now, whether that's so or not, I don't know. But I know this. I know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were direct descendants of Adam. I know that. And I know they were descendants of Adam through who? One got killed. One was a murderer. Adam had two sons. See, this argument goes back a long way, folks. <laughs> Adam had two sons. Who were they? All right. One of them was a murderer. Cain killed Abel, right? I don't know very many people call their son Cain. And I've never met a boy named Judas. <laughs> I mean, you know why? I mean, they say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. We'll call you boy Judas then. <laughs> you know, don't do it. But uh, Well, anyway... All right, so who was the third born then? Seth. Seth. All right. And the Bible gives you the genealogy of Seth, and then it gives you the genealogy of who? Cain. You trace the genealogy of Seth and trace the genealogy of Cain. Which one? I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a guess now. Which side do you think Abraham was born on? <laughs> All right. <laughs> exactly. He's born on Seth. Okay. The side of Seth. All right, so Abraham can trace his father all the way back to Adam and uh, through Seth. And uh, the Canaanite, the rest, where do they trace theirs? You get in trouble, see? All right, anyway. So the land belonged to Abraham that he called out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, That land's your land. I give you this land. It's your land. From the great river all the way to the sea, it's your land. It's your land. From the north to the south, from Dan to Beersheba, it is your land. God gave it to him. Land grant. Genesis 15. Read it. 
It's right there in the book. The sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, therefore, the ones who own that land. And the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the true faith 2,000 years ago, not the Jews' religion. See? Now, you wouldn't believe how much controversial stuff I've talked about here this morning. I mean, they've been fighting wars and killing people for a long time over what I'm talking about right now. It's very, very, very controversial. I didn't even get into the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. But the 11th chapter of the book of Romans tells you what God's done with the Jew, all right, or the Israelite. <clears throat> Did God know that for 2,000 years they wouldn't have a land? Did He know they'd be driven out of their land? All right. How do a people keep their identity if they no longer have their land? If you go down to, if you go down to uh, Florida right now, going to Miami, you'll find the area down there. It's called Little Cuba. Why do they do that? Well, yeah, they, they have, I'm sure, taken it over. But what the, what's the point? They keep their culture, don't they? They keep their language. They, they, they have their identity. All right, They want to keep their identity. Stay with people of themselves. All right, now look at the Jew. He's gone to the four corners of the earth. That's called the diaspora. How does he keep his identity? Okay. How does he do it? How many of you? How many of you in here today uh, know where you know your genealogy? I don't have a clue what I am. I'm a Gentile. <laughs> I've uh, looked in a phone book, and I see a lot of Lawsons over there in Great Britain. And uh, but I'm also uh, from a, uh, you know that's one side of my family. Uh, I don't know where I came from. Probably a long line of bank robbers and bootleggers and who knows what. That's why the Bible says in the book of John, chapter number 1, which were born not of blood, amen, born by the grace of God. But you see, I'm trying to make a point. When you get around people who identify themselves as a certain people with a certain genealogy and a certain identity and a certain blood, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Because when it comes to preaching the gospel of the grace of God, for whosoever will, say, let him come. All right. So in America, we have a unique thing in this country that bonds us together as an American. And what is it? I'm an American. Most Americans don't have a clue where they came from. All right. But a Jew, I don't care where you find him. I don't care if you find him in Arabia or if you find him in Europe or you find him in the United States. He's a Jew. How does he maintain that identity? What does that? What, what, what is it? What is it? Why is it so important for him to keep that identity? Well, yes, they do. Yes, they do. There's a lot of, it. There's a lot of issues involved here. What is the one thing that binds them together? It's not their culture. The culture varies from wherever they are. They're what? All right, that's an identity they take for themselves. They say they're God's chosen people. What's the basis of their religion? The book you're holding in your hand right there. That and the Talmud. The Talmud became the thing that brought them together and gave them identity. The Talmud more than the Bible because they have their own way to interpret the Talmud. It's the book. That's what gives them their identity. Wherever they go, they've got the Talmud. They've got it. And that's, and that's, and, and Jerusalem. The Talmud and Jerusalem. Their identity. My identity is tied up with a book, but my identity mainly is tied up with a person. Jesus Christ. So I can leave here, and I can go to Spain, and understand a few words they say. A few words. But I could not carry on a conversation. But if they were born again believers, if they were truly saved, I could stand right up in the midst of them and sing away. Do you know why? My identity is not Spaniard or it's not European. My identity is the Christ they sing to. All right, that's something. That's a big deal about the New Testament and about what's going on in the book of Romans. Okay? When he talks about a lump, an olive tree, a natural branch, and a wild branch, he's dealing with national identities now. And that's a big deal. We'll talk about that next, next Sunday morning, Lord willing. All right. Father, bless your word now. In thy name we pray. Amen.